So the adoption tax credit, it's a federal tax benefit and it helps taxpayers reduce their tax liability for the year that they adopt a child. So the credit is based on you know, qualified adoption expenses and that the taxpayer paid or incurred to adopt an eligible child. And we'll get into what an eligible child means, but qualified adoption expenses they would include you know, kind of adoption fees, court costs, attorney's fees, um, travel expenses, other expenses directly related to the adoption. Your dream is to become a mom. My dream is to help you get there. I'm Rebecca Greenspan, a single mom through domestic adoption and an adoption consultant for over a decade. I'll be your guide, along with other adoption professionals and members of the Adoption Constellation, walking you step by step down this beautiful and complex path of adopting your baby. When I was going through the adoption process, I had no idea what I was doing, what I needed to know, or more importantly, who to trust. Well, after helping hundreds and hundreds of families grow through the beauty and complexity of adoption, I've learned more than a thing or two, and let me tell you, it's not always rainbows and butterflies. This isn't just another podcast sharing adoption stories, but it's for you if you're genuinely committed to diving in with an open heart, eager to learn everything there is to know about adopting a baby so that you can show up for yourself and your child in the best way possible. This podcast is for you if you're ready to put your newfound knowledge into action. Adoption isn't for the weak of heart and it certainly isn't done when your baby gets placed in your arms. If that's what you think, I'm afraid you're living in la la land. My promise to you is to keep it real if you promise to keep digging. We'll acknowledge the hard and we'll also celebrate the joy that is adoption. You ready? Let's do this. You've been dreaming of becoming a mom for years and finally the timing is right. There's just one daunting obstacle, money. Adoption can be financially overwhelming. Lucky for us, our guest today is here to help you find your way. With over eight years of experience in financial planning and a deep personal understanding of the adoption process, our guest is committed to helping families achieve their dreams of adopting. From budgeting and investment management to tax and estate planning, his team provides comprehensive financial services tailored to adopting families. Meet Matt Joyner, Assistant Vice President of Wealth Management at Fortis Capital Advisors. In 2001 and 2003, Matt's family adopted two little girls from Texas, Lauren and Selena. This life-changing experience inspired Matt to create a pioneering financial planning curriculum for families navigating the adoption process. So cool. Matt lives near Portland, Oregon with his wife, Caroline, enjoying outdoor activities in his spare time and volunteering for the Boy Scouts of America. Matt is also a freelance columnist and is published in the Detroit News, Salem Statesman, and New York Observer. In this episode, Matt will share invaluable insights on how to financially prepare for adoption. Whether you're just considering adoption or already in the process, this episode is packed with practical advice to help you make informed decisions and ensure a secure future for your family. Get your pen and paper ready because you are going to want to take a lot of notes. I can promise you that. Matt, welcome. Let's start with the really personal stuff first because that's the most interesting stuff anyways. Tell me about the adoption of your sisters or as I call my sisters, sissies. <laughs> How old were you? What do you remember about that, that experience? Tell me all of it. Yeah, so um, the story starts on a sad note, unfortunately, which is mm. uh, my mother actually lost my uh, baby brother right at, at birth. Mm. And this was about in 1998, my youngest brother, Jordan. And at that point, you know, my family knew that we always wanted more siblings and my parents wanted other children. And, you know, we made the decision at that point when they said, hey, there's not an option to have more children to look at the adoption process. Mm -hmm. And so there was a family in West Michigan that we had, uh, you know, they were planning to have a baby. We were planning to match with them as the adopting family. 
And at the delivery room, they actually backed out at the 11th hour, said that they weren't going to go through with the adoption. Um, and so that put us in a really uh, difficult position and uh, was uncomfortable. I was about probably five or six at the time. So this was in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and my family made the decision to continue on with the process. We got paired with another adoption um, a, where we were adopting a baby from Texas. And that was my youngest sister, Lauren. This would have been in 2001 when I was just about eight years old. Um, and I remember meeting Lauren at Flint Bishop Airport, which is where we went to receive her. And uh, they had brought her directly to us uh, from Texas. So they flew directly from San Antonio up to Flint, Michigan, where my family was. And I remember all of us being at the airport together and meeting Lauren for the first time. She was just mm -hmm. six days old uh, then. So I can remember all the excitement and, uh, you know, holding her for the first time. And um, I still have pictures from that day and I could vividly place myself uh, in that moment. I so love that. Was that. Yeah. And what and I I'll hear about the other one in a second, but what I've noticed from the very beginning when you started to tell your story is you kept saying we we were adopting, we decided to adopt. So it sounds like your parents really like brought you into the process. Do you remember anything um like leading up to their adoption, what your parents said to you? Um, you know, what that come like how much did they involve you? They involved us to the point of knowing that that was going to be the direction they were going to go. Um, I was probably about five or six years old when we started the adoption process. So young enough to kind of have a general sense of what was going on, mm -hmm. um, but not enough to really know the details of everything that was, was going on, the visits and the meetings with, you know, the, the people getting uh, interviewed for a home study, all the different things that adopting families go through. I have very uh, little recollection of that. The second adoption have certainly a lot more recollection of because I was just a little bit older. I would have been about 10 at the time that we adopted okay. uh, Selena in the second adoption. Awesome. And was it the same type of thing? Were you still super excited about it? Or were you like, oh, another girl? <laughs> <laughs> no. So, you know, we went through the process to complete that adoption. This would have been in 03. Uh, my mother had gone down to Texas to go visit and, you know, meet in person and do that whole thing. Um, my dad was up taking care of us. So we knew kind of what was going on, um, but we actually took a train down to San Antonio, Texas in 03 to complete and finalize that adoption. We were there in the courthouse to finalize the adoption and uh, meeting them for the first time. And, you know, that was all really exciting. So I can recall that. Um, and, you know, the other part of it was there was a language barrier. Um, Selena, when we adopted her, was about, would have been, uh, seven or eight at the time, okay. um, so was fairly young and spoke only Spanish. And, you know, as a young kid, we had developed enough working Spanish to be able to have a conversation, uh, but that proved to be, a, you know, the language barrier was an initial complication for sure. Yeah. And I, that's so, how did, how did you work? And this is so off the subject of money, but how did... <laughs> she learn English? Like how long did that take her and how long did it take? Because that had to have been really hard for her too. Yes. Um, it took a, a while to really pick it up, but I think, you know, being um, and, um, immersed in it, you know, all the time I think was probably helpful mm. where, Hey, they could, they, you know, could learn English uh, that way. But also our neighbor was actually our elementary school Spanish teacher. Um, ah. So they also made it really easy to be able to for more complicated conversations or things that, you know, would require an interpreter. Our neighbor was actually very helpful in that as well. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So let's get into money. There's so much to talk about. And I know we're going to talk about a guide that they can get their hands on that our listeners can get their hands on at the end, it, which is chock full of information. But Okay, it's obvious that you have a connection to adoption and it's been very meaningful in your life, but was there something in particular that inspired you to specifically work with adoptive families? Can you talk about that and also give us a broad overview of how you work with adoptive families? Yeah, absolutely. So really this starts probably right around the time that actually after that adoption was finalized, the second adoption in 2010, we actually lost my, my mom. She unfortunately passed mm -hmm. away from cancer. So um, 
That's I appreciate that. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we went through uh, as a family was, you know, the financial considerations uh, mm -hmm. of not, you know, now my dad being a single parent to four kids um, was a really difficult place to be. Um, and when I worked in financial services, when I finally made the decision to go into independent practice, one of my first clients said to me, I mean, about five to seven years, we're going to be looking at adopting a child. What should we be thinking about today? And so it was kind of a sign that, hey, this is probably something worth exploring. I'm sure there are other people who have this question. Yeah. Um, and it was so funny that it was one of my first clients uh, when I went uh, as an independent practice. So I really wanted to create a firm that would have been something like what my dad needed right after my mom passed and something that my parents needed in 1998, 1999, when they were beginning the process to navigate the complexities around financing uh, you know, an adoption. Yeah, so it just kind of fell in your lap because maybe you wouldn't have otherwise done it, but what a perfect like kismet moment that, and, and so do you work mostly with adoptive families now or that's just a, a specialty niche for you? It's a, a, I actually makes up a big, probably the single largest bulk of clients that I work with. So I'd say oh probably God. between 30 and 40% of the clients that I work with fall into that category. Um, I've gotten tons of referrals from people who are, uh, from adopting families and it's kind of grown into this, you know, word of mouth uh, practice, as it were. Um, I do a little bit of marketing around it, but most of the way that clients find me is by referrals and things like that. That's excellent. So give me a, a little bit of an overview of what that looks like um, when a family comes to you. Are they coming to you because they are going through the adoption journey mostly, or is it just overall hey, we want to look at our finances and we happen to be adopting in the next couple of years. What what do you see most? Yeah, it's a little combination of both. I think, you know, what I get a lot with, you know, one segment of the clients that I work with is people who say adoption's a, a goal that I have that's out there in the distance. What should I be doing today to prepare for that? What are the things that I should be thinking about right at this moment that, you know, if we go through with an adoption that puts us in a good spot to be able to do that, right? Um, and so that's really one part of the clients that I work with. The other part is, you know, where grandparents are stepping in to adopt their grandchildren. I would say that's another component of adoptions that I deal with where, you know, maybe there's addiction issues with the parents or there's, you know, um, some other issues where they can't take care of the kids where we're stepping mm -hmm. in to help a retiree now think through, okay, how do we navigate this on your financial plan? to one, get them covered for medical insurance, how to navigate, you know, if, if one of the parents, you know, predeceases the kids, social security complications, there's all these things that kind of flow into that. So um, that's another segment of the client base that I work with too. Wow, interesting. Um, what are some of the most common financial challenges? First of all, how smart of families to bring that up to you well in advance <laughs> um, because there's so much, because adoptions are so expensive and usually people don't have just like, Sixty thousand dollars that that that's liquid to spend. So, what are some of the most common financial challenges adoptive families face, and how can they prepare for them? So, I think the the first step of knowing that you know you're ready to to do something is acknowledging, hey, this is the goal, right? Knowing that that's the direction you want to go in, I think that's helpful to know from the jump, right? Because if you have more time money works longer and harder for you. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, you know, a really nice uh, thing to have as a tailwind, right? Is, is just enough time. Uh, so giving yourself enough time is important. The other challenges that I see are under insurance. Uh, that's another complication I see. So if something happens to both of the parents or they predecease the kids, is there something in place for their care, for their education to maintain their standard of living? Um, do they have an estate plan, right? Um, it's not enough that you just have a will or a trust in place, but also making sure that your beneficiaries on your accounts actually reflect that will, because what they'll do is if a parent predeceases, the custodians will go off of how your account beneficiaries are set up, not actually what's in your will or trust. Uh, so that's something that, you know, needs to be kind of really carefully planned out. And so those are common pitfalls that I see um, from a lot of adopting families is, you know, along the financial planning spectrum. But, you know, there's countless other ones, too. They're probably even a little bit smaller. Well, I'm glad there are people like you because 
you've already kind of lost me on some of that insurance stuff. But um, before we go further, I saw the cutest little kitten. And if you're watching on <laughs> YouTube or video, this kitten is so teeny. Is it a baby? She is an elderly lady, a cat that we have. Her name is Miss Piper. <laughs> she is so cute. She is. She is the office manager here uh, at the home office. Uh, Everybody so, needs one. That's I've right. I've got a golden doodle who's my office manager. Yeah. Um, okay. So we were talking about some of the issues that you can prepare for. And now I would love for you to just kind of walk us through how you work with a family. They come to you. What do you look at first? Um, especially knowing that they are planning to adopt or they have just started the process and know that they have to come up with this big chunk of money. Yeah, so think of it very much like the home study process, right? There's an okay. information gathering that you go through. So when I meet with clients, one, there's usually an introduction call where we'll kind of talk through, hey, is this a good fit? Is this something that you're looking for help on? We wanna kind of get an assessment of where they're at in their financial planning journey. Once we've kind of gotten to that point and we agree, hey, you know, let's have a conversation about this. Again, it's very similar to applying for a mortgage or going through the home study process on the financial planning side where you want to gather, you know, your mortgage documents. I want to see previous years, 1040s. Um, you know, I kind of do a full review of the financial scope of their, their picture. I want to understand how they're insured, if they have workplace insurance, workplace benefits, 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, everything, you know, financially that we can look at together. Um, and then from there, you know, really, I want to get a sense of their goals, right? So we want to understand kind of where do they want to go? Where are they trying to get to? Adoption falls into that, but also we want to think about their other nearer term goals. Do they own a home? Do they want to buy a home? Do they, when do they want to retire? Um, all those other considerations that are financial and in, in scale and scope. Um, and then, you know, once we've kind of sat down and, you know, gotten an understanding of that, I come back with, you know, kind of a, a, a plan, right? You know, here's what we're going to do to get you to this goal. Here's how we should invest these assets if your adoption is this far out versus, you know, 20 years out or however much it is or retirement. We look at all of these goals in their totality. I come back with a, some type of recommendation of how we're going to tackle those together. Yeah. And, and all these things that you're talking about, you said, think of it very much as the home study. And guess what, everybody, you're going to need all those things that Matt looks at for the home study anyways. So starting to gather it now is not a bad idea. In fact, and, and maybe Matt, you have some ideas. I often recommend families um, use something like, I know when I was going through the adoption, I used something called mint.com. I think it's part of uh, QuickBooks or Intuit now, but, uh, or Rocket Money or you know, to, to bring all of my financials into one place because those numbers change as you go like daily. And so as you're um, signing up with different agencies and filling out all these applications and each application is a little bit different, but you're still going to need all those numbers that it's easy to get to. How do you recommend people like organize all that? Yeah, so they just got rid of Mint, actually. I think it was about oh, two did. months ago. Yeah, okay. so they shut it down. But I do have a financial tracker that will track uh, financial your financial picture over in real time. Oh, um, awesome. It's, it's done through what's called Right Capital, which is a financial planning software. And uh, I allow it access for free. So I give a light version of that for free, which does allow you to track all of your finances. And it does give you some light financial planning tools in there as well. Oh, um, great. So that's very nice, and I recommend anybody who's interested uh, can use it. I also have free access to uh, PlansWell, which is another software people can use to spit out a retirement uh, plan for themselves in probably 15 minutes. Great. I'll get those links from you, and I'll put them in the show notes. Perfect. Absolutely. What are some of the other tools that can help families navigate the financial aspects of adoption more effectively? You know, I would say, you know, working with a planner can help, right? Part of being a planner is, you know, we are the record keeper of the plan itself, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's our job to maintain a, a record of, you know, where your financial picture is at, what the death benefits of insurance policies are, what insurance policies are in place, uh, what disability insurance you have, 401k balances, IRA balances, brokerage account balances, stock employee purchase plan, you know, account balances. So we keep all that as a record. Um, 
but I think working with a planner can definitely help with that. The tools I would certainly recommend using, of course, those are, you know, you don't have to have a planner in order to be able to use those, but working with a planner can certainly help put all of it together in one, you know, one plan there. Yeah. And, and there are definitely others that we'll dig into in a little bit. Um, I think this next question might start, start us down a, a different road, road of really, um, this is where you'll probably want to start taking notes, but um, let's talk about some of the common financial pitfalls that adopt a family space and what steps they can do to avoid them. So for instance, I know a lot of families who dip into their 401k. That, to me, I'm guessing is a pitfall. Is that a good idea? And what are some of the other things that you're seeing? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that most people don't know about is that you can take a penalty-free distribution from a qualified plan. So this would be like a 401k, a 403b, a 457, um, an IRA. And you could draw that out and actually there's what's called a 72T distribution. It's a special code in the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, But basically what it allows you to do is take a $5,000 penalty-free distribution per adoptee, so per adopted child. So from all of those, I thought it was just IRA. So you can do it from any of your investment? um, Any of your qualified plans. So any of those qualified plans are eligible for that, that distribution. Um, cool. There is a specific, so it does get counted as ordinary income. Um, so just keep that in mind. It does, you know, push you up as far as your income goes when you report it on your your you know 1040. Ah, uh, but there are ways to forego that tax withholding. So if you said, hey, you know what, I'd actually not like to withhold taxes. There's a specific form that you can fill out to forego that. Otherwise, they'll take an automatic deduction for federal taxes. Okay. So you can take a certain amount, but is it is it beneficial to use, like, say I have $100,000 in a 401k and the adoption it, it costs 60000 and I'm $30,000 short. Can I, so, is that a good idea to use that? It's, it's, you got to weigh it with everything else that's in your financial plan. And this is where a financial planner really makes a lot of sense is how do we weigh these different goals? Because if you have a hundred thousand dollar 401k, you can take up to a $50,000 loan against the balance of your 401k. Um, you could potentially do that. Um, is it advisable to do it? That's completely, you know, another consideration as, as well entirely. Are you going to get hit with a big penalty if you do that? Not as a as a loan against the 401k. Interesting. Um, is there not, a big interest to pay it back? There is an interest that you pay back, but it's deducted out of your um, paychecks every period. So every pay period that you have, they'll take a specific amount that they will go directly back to pay that loan off. And it's done directly through your payroll deductions. Wow. That's interesting. So, I mean, obviously the biggest pitfall is that people don't have it. <laughs> right. Um. Is there anything else that you can think of? Uh, as far as, you know, that being a, a major pitfall, there's times when that doesn't make sense, right? So, you know, where it's going to make more sense to try and really save up for the adoption or to ask family for help, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are gift exemptions uh, for parents to, grandparents to give to their children to pay for their grandchildren's adoption if they decide to go that route, that they can utilize the gift exemption of $18,000 a year per parent to contribute to that adoption as well. So there's other strategies that I'll encourage people to to look at, um, you know, as far as funding and adoption or, you know, just asking family members for that type of thing as well. So there are a lot of families who come in and they only make fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year, and they don't have family that can help them, and they're barely making the the income that's, you know, going to help them finance uh, an adoption. Would you tell them don't adopt, or are there ways you think that could make sense? There are so many different adoption grants and loans that exist out there, and it really just depends on, it's not a very satisfying answer, I'll say that, is it just depends, right? So what is the right case or the right mix for a family that maybe doesn't have a ton of income to be able to expend on an adoption? Can they go a loan route? Can they go the grant route? How much can they do of crowdfunding? You know, things like that. What are things that they can utilize that are kind of within the, the five feet around them to be able to, to raise capital for this adoption. 
Um, and then usually I'll say after that, then you can go into the financial engineering side to say, how much can we draw on a 401k loan or take a 72T distribution or things of that nature? Those are usually kind of the last places that I would encourage someone to look um, because we don't want to sabotage the retirement goals in order to get this nearer term goal, right? So when you say within five, a five feet reach around you, can you expand more on that? Yeah, so... So think about, you know, all the different organizations that exist out there that offer adoption grants or adoption loans. Those are the things that are accessible to them right now that they can get, you know, access to. They can fill out a grant form. They can fill out an application to, you know, take a loan if they want to do that for an adoption. There are resources that exist around that. So that's kind of what I mean when I say the five feet around them is, you know, this is just what's readily available through the Internet or, you know, that they can do on their own even. Okay. So you have loans and grants, you have your own investments, you have family members. What are some other places that people can access? Yeah. So life insurance is one. So if you have cash value of life insurance, so these would be like whole life policies or variable life policies, um, you could take loans against those plans. Um, That's Mm -hmm. also an option that you have as well um if you already have them that's great i wouldn't get a life and i don't again it will depend but i don't know that i would get a life insurance policy to be able to borrow against it for this specific purpose it's a that could be a rather expensive way to go about it um but again it'll depend on situation to situation yeah um the other things i'm thinking are just simply saving right when you get paid paying yourself first of course and if somebody's doing that, is there a certain percentage that you would advise them on? Like what's the minimum percentage and what kind of account would you put that money in? Yeah, so it depends on, on what it's needed for. Um, you know, one of the first things that I encourage families to take a look at is their emergency expenses. Um, having six to a, six months to a year of emergency expenses set aside because you don't wanna have gone through the adoption process, spent all the cash you have, and then all of a sudden, you know, a, one medical emergency puts you on the brink of co- complete financial collapse or, you know, the heater went out. And now I got to spend X amount for a new heater, you know, to heat the house. Those are things that you want to make sure you're accommodating for. Um, but as far as, you know, saving, how much should you save for? It depends on, you know, the timeline of that goal. So if it's five years, that's going to look a little different than if we need it in the next two years. Um, and how we invest, that's going to look a little different as well, whether we're going to use some type of high yield savings account, whether, you know, we're just going to put it in a traditional checking account, um, something that's FDIC insured, very safe, very stable, uh, you know, things of that nature, too. Before we go on, we're going to take a quick break, but don't go away. We still have so much to talk about. Hey there, Adoption Roadmap fam. Are you ready to take the next step on your journey to parenthood? If so, head over to our website and take our quiz. It's called, Are You Ready to Adopt? It's not just about testing your knowledge. It's about making sure you're emotionally and practically prepared for the beautiful, complex journey of adoption. Let's make your dream of parenthood a reality. Go to rgadoptionconsulting.com and take the Are You Ready to Adopt quiz today. That's rgadoptionconsulting.com. The quiz is free, and it will let you know where you are in the process and if you're ready to jump into your adoption journey. Got it. And I know you're not, I, I know this isn't like official advice, financial advice. Um, and that all sounds beautiful to have like this, this savings for an emergency fund. But let's be real, Matt. People, like take every last penny that they have to be able to become a mom or dad for the first time, especially for the first time, but (laughs) maybe even for second, third, or fourth time, Um, people will do anything. And I get it. I I was one of them. And it takes a long time to build that back up when you do that. So this is sage advice. Um, whether people take it or not is another thing. Um, but even if you don't take it, having somebody there for you after you adopt is probably a great idea to talk about 
okay, how can now we rebuild, get that emergency fund set and college funds and all sorts of other things that, that you'll have to worry about afterwards, which which kind of leads me into how can adoptive families balance their immediate costs of adoption with long-term financial goals? You've touched upon that and investments. Are there any tips of prioritizing? And Yeah, absolutely. So as far as prioritizing, you know, financial planning goals, is it's it's going to be person to person. So if the adoption is the most near term, com, you know, consideration that we have to be thinking about, you know, okay, how much is this going to cost? Let's start planning out those adoption expenses. What's that going to look like? And then that starts to translate into some of the more complex things like, okay, here's, you know, the sources you could draw from of your retirement accounts if we decide to go that route. Here's, you know, the modified adjusted gross income limits for the, you know, adoption tax credit. That starts to trick you, you know, matriculate into the more complex financial planning that we do for clients. That's more tax planning. Are there employee adoption benefits that are available to them? Those are taxable. Uh, so, you know, how do we, you know, count that as part of our, our strategy or part of our uh, income planning for this event, right? So, you know, those are kind of the, some of the things we think about in the totality of, you know, planning for their adoption. Okay, you mentioned two things that I want to dig deeper on. You mentioned the tax credit and employee benefits. Let's talk about the tax credit first. Um, talk to me about what it is and how it works. Yeah, so um, you're in Ohio, am I correct? I am. And so the Wendy's Corporation, one of the fun facts about the adoption tax credit is uh, Dave Thomas was actually one of the champions of the adoption tax credit. He testifies in Congress in the mid to late 90s about the need for the adoption tax credit and is really mm. a hero of that. Uh, Bill Clinton signs it into law, I think, in either nine, late 96 or 97 uh, when that adoption tax credit gets uh, passed and put through. Um, and it's something that, you know, he was a, a big champion of. And Bill Clinton actually thanks him. Uh, for his contributions to adoption in that as well. So kind of ah. a, a cool, neat history of the adoption tax credit. Uh, fun but fact of, fun of fact. this episode. <laughs> I didn't know that, that Dave yes. Thomas had a, had a part in that. That's a, that's a great fun fact. It was very instrumental in it. Um, there are, you know, a number of different pieces of criteria that uh, will trip people up. So, for example, the adoption tax credit is to uh, basically deduct uh, you know, your expenses related to an adoption, okay? And there are specific requirements that have to be met. So, for example, if someone does an international adoption, you can't take that adoption tax credit until that uh, child has become a U.S. citizen. Mm. Uh, so that's interesting as well. So if you're not able to do that, right, that delays your ability to take the adoption tax credit. So those are some of the things that I help people work through. Um, you know, you get up to about $16,810 in 2024 that you can deduct. Um, for that adoption tax credit, and uh, that's the max credit amount. And then there's an income, you know, phase out for that, which starts at about two hundred fifty-two thousand and goes all the way up to about two hundred ninety-two thousand, uh, where you start to be able to phase out of being able to take that tax credit. All so, right. So let's dumb it down a little bit. Sure. Um, how exactly does that work? Do you, yeah, when can you apply the tax credit? What do you need for it? And um, Am I just getting money sent to me afterwards? So as far as, you know, the, the credit itself, it just goes to reduce their tax liability. So what does that for, mean? Yeah. So let's say, for example, you owed $20,000. Okay. Um, a tax credit, it's not a refundable credit. So, for example, can only bring your tax liability down to zero. You wouldn't get any money back. So it's not a, you wouldn't get a refund if you ha if you only had um, if you earned fifteen thousand dollars and you had eighteen thousand dollars of expenses you wouldn't get the three hundred or the three thousand dollars back as a refund on that it can only bring your tax liability down to zero so in that case if you only earned fifteen thousand you could only deduct fifteen thousand of expenses on that if that makes sense yeah okay so I, I've I've I, I think I want to explain it another way, but tell me if I have this wrong. First of all, you can only apply the adoption tax credit in the year that you are in the year that you finalize. Correct. That you do your taxes for. So, for instance, 
If you finalize your adoption, which usually happens about six months after your adoption, in 2024, you finalize. When you do your taxes in 2025 for the 2024 year, that's when you can apply it. Yes. So I make $50,000 a year, let's say, okay? And that tax credit, I thought it was I thought it was depending uh, dependent on how much taxes were taken out of my um you know how how much I paid in taxes is that not how it works so it, it gets really a little confusing it gets a little confusing right so there's taxes that you take out for withholding right so through your pay period or um you know through your regular paychecks that you get and then at the end of the year, you, when you go to file your taxes, you reconcile what you withheld versus what you may still owe. Um, when you take your gross income, you then start to go through the process of taking those deductions and looking at tax credits and piecing that all together. Uh, what's important about that is, you know, that's when you start to look at, hey, here are the credits that I'm eligible for. Here's what I can then take. Um, if you're doing an adoption in one year, it may make more sense to itemize as opposed to taking the standard deduction. The overarching point of the adoption tax credit will be that in the year that you complete an adoption, it's going to make a lot of sense to sit down with a CPA. And we actually bring in a CPA to help navigate the adoption tax credit and also to help people think through the taxability of their employee benefits that they're getting for an adoption. Right. So, you know, we kind of bring all of these resources to bear to help people navigate that when they go to file to make it easier on them, right? So that yeah. they're not having to crunch this into TurboTax and figure out, okay, you know, did I do this right or did I get that correct? Okay, so you mentioned two things there. You mentioned the tax credit and employee benefits. Let's start with the adoption tax credit. Can you tell, give us an overview of what it is and how it works? And what I'll just start with is, I know that you can't um, apply the adoption tax credit until you do taxes for the year you finalized your adoption, which means finalization usually happens six months after you adopt your baby, typically. So if I finalize an adoption in 2024, I'm gonna be doing my 2024 taxes in 2025, and that's when I can implement the adoption tax credit, correct? That's correct. Okay, so great. I, now give us an overview. So the adoption tax credit, it's a federal tax benefit, and it helps taxpayers reduce their tax liability for the year that they adopt a child. So the credit is based on you know qualified adoption expenses and that the taxpayer paid or incurred to adopt an eligible child. And we'll get into what an eligible child means, but qualified adoption expenses, they would include you know kind of adoption fees, court costs, attorney's fees, um, travel expenses, other expenses directly related to the adoption. Now, the one important thing to note is that the adoption tax credit is not a refundable credit. So that means it can only reduce your tax liability to zero, and you can carry forward any unused credit for up to five years or until it's fully used, whichever comes first. Um, the credit is also subject to income limitations, which we'll kind of get into in a moment, but that starts right around about 252000 right up to 292000 Okay, so if I make uh, under 252000 for the household, right? It's not uh, individual, it's combined. Correct. Um, then you're eligible for the full tax credit. And then anything above that, you start to wean down. And you, you can get partial tax credit up until you make, what's the threshold? A uh, two hundred ninety-two thousand and one hundred fifty dollars, to be exact. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you make more than that, you don't qualify for any tax credit. Correct. Yep. So okay. it starts phasing out at two hundred fifty-two thousand one hundred fifty dollars. Okay. Okay. And I know it's it's really nuanced, and there's people who there there's accountants who specialize in the adoption tax credit. I think you you guys even bring someone in, and and I, I know that there's a couple out there that that just do that. <laughs> yes. And, you know, keep in mind that the maximum credit amount, at least for 2024, so as of this episode, it's about 16810 wow. per child. 
Um, so it's sizable. If you don't end up uh, being able to use all of it in the full year, you can, like I said, extend that out an additional five years. It's got to carry over. That's awesome. So you said something about an eligible child. What's that? So an eligible child um, it has to be under 18 years old. Okay. Stands to reason. Uh, the adoption has to be finalized. So you have to have legally adopted the child and the adoption is not subject to being reversed or annulled. Um, the adoption cannot be from a step parent unless the child is a special needs child, which is its own level of financial planning as well. Um, can't have been from a surrogate parent arrangement unless the child is a special needs child. And the child has to be a US citizen, national or resident. Okay, so that's you know also important as well. There are some exceptions that apply for international adoption needs of special needs children, but for the conversations that you know you and I are most likely having day to day, um, especially for an international adoption, they just have to again be a U.S. citizen, national, or resident in order to be able to qualify for that adoption tax credit. Okay. Do you happen to know what how special needs is defined? Uh, it. I do not have that. That's a whole okay. level of, of planning that we have a, d a group that just does special needs planning. And like I said, I'm, I focus more on the adoption side. Because I know agency to agency, that term is thrown out and it, it, anything can be special needs or not, you know. Um, the other thing, and, and you may or may not know the answer to this, do you know anything about um, utilizing the adoption tax credit in a year that you had a disrupted or a fall through where maybe an adoption fell through and you lost $30,000. Yeah, I do not believe that you can take an adoption tax credit for that. Um, I do not, that's not something that would be um, unfortunately allowed in that case, as far as I'm aware. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so moving on to the uh, employee benefits. And I know more and more, and, and Dave Thomas had something to do with this too, I know. And, and I know the Dave Thomas Foundation used to put out a list every year, I don't know if they still do, of organizations and corporations who have adoption tax, uh, not tax credits, adoption benefits, which I used to look at every year. Um, now it's it's a lot. A lot of companies are doing it now, and I don't know if Dave Thomas Foundation still puts that out. They do. Now they actually still put that out of adoption friendly places to work. Awesome. Uh, they they put that out every single year, and they really help spearhead employer adoption assistance programs mm -hmm. um, and really getting that rolled out. There are so many corporations today that have it, so that's one of the first things I encourage people to think about as soon as we know about adoption is to start looking and saying, okay, you know, what employer benefits are eligible to you um, that you have through your employer? Uh, that's one of the first things we look at. So one thing to note on, you know, employer benefits is that they are taxable to the employee. Uh, so that's important to think about. And, you know, they can exclude up to 16,810 of qualifying adoption assistance benefits from an employee's gross income. And, you know, that, means the adoption assistance under the annual limit is exempt from federal income tax withholding, but it's not exempt from federal unemployment taxes, which are called FUTA. So there are complications that exist with that, that again, we work with a tax specialist, we bring in tax people to help with this, uh, and so that they don't have to think through that alone or have to be worrying about that uh, as we go through the process to help them prep and file. Wait, so you're telling me and usually, by the way, you get these benefits after you adopt. Um, so if, if a company is giving me $10,000 toward my adoption, you're saying that's taxable money? Yes. Yeah, so it can um, be excluded up to 16810 If they give you more than that, then, it's, then it can become taxable. So there is an exclusion okay. amount that they have, but it's not exempt from federal unemployment taxes, FUTA taxes. Okay. Got it. Huh, I never knew that. Interesting. All right, all this stuff, by the way, is so way above my head that hopefully the listeners will understand it more than me, but that's why I have somebody like you. And if my <laughs> listeners are anything like me, they say, just tell me what to do. Right. I know this exists. I don't know what it means. Just tell me what to do. But it's always good to have a general overview and, and understand at least the basics so that you can get the help that you need. Okay, 
Um, are there any other places that you, let's talk about military benefits for a second, because I know that's on one of your uh, brochures that I mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What are there military benefits and do you know anything about them? So there are some uh, military benefits. You'll have to give me a second to pause and look back at my, some of my notes okay. here. Sorry. Um, I just saw it on your sheet. Veterans it's, makes uh, up such a small, small, small piece of the, the client base that I, that military I work with. Military will reimburse active duty personnel up to $2,000 in expenses per Department of Defense. So um, I can just mention that. I'll just mention okay. that. One other thing I want to mention, I think if you're active duty military, there are some benefits you can get as well. I believe it's up to $2,000. I don't know exactly how that works, but if you are in the military, you should definitely look into that as well. Is there anything that we missed as far as how families can raise money, get money, save money, borrow money? So one of the things that sticks out to me right away is 529 plans. Uh, ah, so especially okay. when there's child adoptions where the children are not infants or babies, where they might be, you know, maybe just a few years old. Um, one of the things that I encourage people to do as soon as they even know that they're planning to either have children or adopt, uh, regardless of their situation, is to open a 529 plan. One of the few things that most people don't know is you can open a 529 plan under your own name and social security number and then change that beneficiary to the child once the child is either born or adopted. Oh, so okay. You, so that allows you to start thinking and compounding the growth of a 529 plan for their college education expenses and, you know, begin that process, especially, like I said, if the child is a little bit older or, you know, is, is still young but not a newborn or an infant, you've already lost just a few years of the compounding growth. So opening that 529 plan as soon as you know is a really key thing. Even if you contribute, you know, a couple bucks here every single month, it goes a long way. Wow. Great. What's the most important piece of advice you would give someone who is just starting their adoption journey? And you just gave a great one. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the one thing I think is really important is um, remember why you're doing it. I think that's a really key part of this. And, you know, it will be hard. It will be difficult at times. And, you know, it will stress everybody out at some point or another because uh, it's not easy. And adoptions are difficult things, and um, it's not an easy path to go down. Mm -hmm. But get back to the core of why you're doing it and think about that a lot and come back to that. Um, I'll only plug one book here, which is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a phenomenal mm. book. If you've never read it, I would encourage everybody to read it. Um, and it's about, you know, how to go through tough times, right? You know, not suffering in vain because we go back to the why of why we're doing something, why we're going through this. Um, if you struggle through something that's hard and you don't know why you're doing it, that's, you know, you suffer more for that, right? As opposed to knowing your why or your core reason for doing something. And that doesn't apply just to adoption, but I think just anything generally in life. I love that. Thank you so much for that. I always joke that <laughs> for, when I adopted, I was working in the non- I, when I started the adoption journey, actually my infertility journey first, I was I was working in the nonprofit industry. And by the time I ended up adopting and spending way less than what adoption is now, but still so much more than I ever thought I could write a check for, I, I thought to myself, huh, if you really want to buy a Mercedes with cash, you can do it. It just <laughs> takes some creativity. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Matt, thank you so much for all these golden nuggets. I want to end with a couple rapid fire questions for you um, to get you off balance a little bit. So before I get into my rapid fire piece that we like to end with, and when I say we, I mean I, <laughs> Tell our listeners how they can get their hands on this really amazing brochure for adoptive families and how to prepare financially. Yeah, so you can find all of my resources on adoptionfinancialplanning.com. Um, and on there, there are all sorts of different resources. Uh, so the free guide itself, you can find under free stuff. Um, so you can download that adoption guide under that. And then there's also all the financial planning tools 
the financial planning tracker, the retirement planner. There's all these different tools that you can use and they're completely free of charge. Wonderful. And I assume that that's how they could work with you as well if they decide that that's a good fit. Absolutely. Perfect. I'll link that in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. This recording is limited to the dissemination of general information pertaining to adoption planning. Nothing presented within constitutes specific investment advice, tax or accounting advice, legal insurance or regulatory advice, or an offer to sell or solicitation of an offer to buy any security. While reasonable efforts were used to obtain information from sources believed to be reliable, Fortis Capital Advisors, LLC, makes no representation that the information or opinions contained in these materials are accurate, reliable, or complete. All information and opinions contained in this presentation are subject to change without notice. Investment advice is offered through Fortis Capital Advisors, LLC, 7301 Mission Road, Suite 326, Prairie Village, Kansas, 66208. Fortis Capital Advisors, LLC, is an investment advisor registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. Additional information about Fortis Capital Advisors, LLC, is available on the SEC's website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Fortis Capital Advisors, LLC, mainly provides investment advice to individual investors and businesses. Who is one person or one organization that has had a big impact on you as it relates to adoption? As it relates to adoption? Yeah. I would say probably Dave Thomas. Um, mm. Dave Thomas is the hero of, of adoption in a way that I uh, think not a lot of people give uh, tons of recognition for. And, you know, the adoption tax credit is something that I help clients navigate uh, throughout the year, which, I mean, largely could not have happened had he not championed it. So I'll, I'll, I'll give that as my answer is probably the most profound impact on my adoption experience and the adoption experience of my clients. Terrific. What's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? It doesn't have to be adoption related. What's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? Know thyself. I would say is a big part of what we do and what I do as a investment advisor is helping people think through why they believe certain things or why they think certain things. Um, we always joke that an investment advisor is 10% investments and it's 90% advising. And that's a pretty good summation of what, what we do. Um, we talk a lot about the psychology of money with our clients. We talk about how they think about money, how you know they're approaching you know things that are happening in the world or in the news. Um, how they're thinking about that in the context of their financial plan. So uh, know thyself is really uh, important. It's probably one of the most sage advice that I could probably give to a client or anyone. Profound. What's one thing about your job working with adoptive parents that you didn't expect? I would say um, how prepared they were. Um, I work with a lot of other retirees as well and other people who are not just in that realm of financial planning, who are, you know, income retirements or planning or we're doing Medicare planning or Social Security planning. All those things factor into what I help adopting families with. But my adopting families come to me so prepared because they've they're going through it. Right. Or they're thinking about it proactively. So I think a lot of times. I, I get a sense that they are very well prepared for those conversations about what they need to do. And they're very open-minded to what we, what needs to be done in order to get them to this goal. What's been your biggest failure or mistake that you've made when working with adoptive families and what did you learn from it? Biggest mistake when working with adopting families is not getting into it soon enough. Mm, <laughs> love it. I know that seems like a, maybe, maybe an avoiding answer, but I, you know, when I realized that this was something that was an underserved part of the industry, um, and when I realized that so many people had so many different questions, and when I talked to attorneys who refer clients to me, uh, where they were saying, hey, these are questions I'm getting all the time. How do I, how do I talk to these clients about this? Or how, how are you going to solve these problems for us? Um, I wish I'd known about that sooner. So I think, you know, getting into this space um, sooner would have been better. Before I let you go, 
Describe adoption in three words. Tough, but awesome. Thank you so much, Matt Joyner. This has been great, and I'm sure people got a lot out of it. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please follow us, rate us, and uh, tune in every Wednesday morning and Friday morning for a new episode. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Adoption Roadmap Podcast. If you did, I have a few favors to ask of you. First, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, I'd love to hear your takeaways. Please write a review and let me know what you liked. And if you have a question or a suggestion on what you'd like to hear, I'd love to hear that too please shoot me an email at support at rgadoptionconsulting.com and let me know what you'd like to hear about. And if you have a question, I may just answer it online. Thanks again for listening. Tune in every Wednesday and Friday morning for a brand new episode of the Adoption Roadmap Podcast. Until next time, bye-bye.